In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report this morning comes from the book of Daniel yet again. Like I said, we're going through this little series when it comes to the book of Daniel. And if you'll remember what we were talking about yesterday is the king has had this dream and he wants the people that are surrounding him, the magicians, the Chaldeans, the people that are supposed to be mystics and, and experts in this stuff. He wants them to tell him the interpretation of his dream and they can't. And not only does he want them to tell them the interpretation, he wants him to, he wants them to tell him the dream because otherwise they could just be making up anything as the interpretation. He's like, no, 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 you have to tell me the dream and then you have to tell me the interpretation and then I'll know that the interpretation is actually real, which actually is weirdly enough, a pretty good standard because if they can tell you the dream, they can probably tell you how to translate it, how to interpret it. And so because of this, the king actually has a pretty interesting standard, and you'll remember the other day, these Chaldeans and magicians were saying, nobody can do this. No human being would be able to accomplish this task for you. And they're actually 100% right in this. They, without realizing it, kind of explained why it would have to be God that would be able to do this. It would have to be someone with divine, supernatural power. And so because of this, the king is very upset. He's angry that none of the magicians can do this. But he says, if anybody lies to me, they don't actually know what the dream is, but they try to guess it and they get it wrong, I'm going to kill them. Well, this goes on for a little while. And the king is so upset that he says, you know what? I'm just killing all of my magicians, all of my wise men. You're all going to die. And news of this gets back to Daniel and his young friends and all the other young men from other countries that are being kept there and being sort of made ready to be in the service of the king, the other educated wise men. And Daniel happens to be in that group as well. And we have here this sort of uh, situation where he says, you know what, as king, you guys are worthless. You're all fakes and phonies. And so I'm just going to get rid of all of you. I'm going to kill all of the wise men, all of the wise men in my employ." Even the ones that aren't you, even the ones I haven't even talked to yet, because again, he's a pagan king. It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, but this is what he does. And so he just decides he's going to off all of his wise men, all of his magicians and advisors on supernatural matters. And then when this word gets back to Daniel, Daniel says, I'll interpret his dream. I'll do it. And so finally, we have somebody that's volunteering to actually go and interpret the king's dream for him. So props to Daniel, man, he stepped up and think about the kind of faith that it takes for Daniel to do this. He has enough faith in God and the spiritual gift of dream interpretation that he's been given that Daniel's sitting there going, yeah, I can do this. And if I'm wrong, I'll lose my life, but I'm not going to lose my life because God's not going to let me down. Daniel had an amazing amount of faith here. And you have to appreciate that. And here's the irony in this whole thing, because we all know the outcome of the story. But Daniel, through God's power, is about to save from death a bunch of pagan magicians. I want you to think about that. These are a bunch of pagan magicians that worship all kinds of other gods and are engaged in witchcraft and all kinds of other things that God would not approve of. And yet... This is the group of people that are under fire, that are under threat, and they're about to have their lives spared because God performs a miracle through Daniel. So even the fake people, the ones that don't really have supernatural powers, are about to be saved by the one true God. There's a healthy dose of dramatic irony sort of floating around in that. And we see how the story unfolds in the second chapter of Daniel verses 17 through 18, where it says, Then Daniel went to his house and informed his friends Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah about the matter, so that they might request compassion from the God of heaven concerning 
this mystery, so that Daniel and his friends would not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So this is essentially Daniel's prescription. He's already agreed to go forward. He's already agreed to interpret the king's dream. And he is the one that is going to be the guy on the hot seat. And I love how he reacts to it. He goes to his house. He gathers up his friends, his brothers, those that love God and worship him just like he does. And they get together and pray about it. That says a lot about Daniel's priorities and a lot about who he trusts. That when this horrible thing is about to happen, when his life is under threat, he says, you know what? We're going to meet up with the brothers, the other people that have the same faith as me, and we're going to pray about it. And that's what's going to solve this problem. This is an amazing testament to how much Daniel believes in God and how much he trusts him to protect him. And so because of this, his three friends there, which, by the way, their other names are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these are the same guys that get thrown into the furnace a little bit later, and we're going to get to that story in a moment. But you're looking at this, and he gets together with these three friends that also have really strong faith and sort of surround Daniel and pray for him and encourage him because they believe in Daniel too. And because God believes in Daniel and he knows that they believe in him as well, Daniel is able to do this very brave thing, going before the king and interpreting the dream for him. And this really mirrors other things, other times that were complicated in the lives of God's people, where they got together with people they trusted, people that had the same faith as them, and worshipped God and prayed and fasted and, and engaged in other activities like that to call upon God's favor. This happens, for example, in the book of Esther. Esther's entire race is facing extinction from Babylon. And what does she do? She gets together with a bunch of her maids and the people that are ladies in waiting with her, and they fast and they pray. And Mordecai and the Jews that are living in, in that particular region at the time, they do the same thing. When you're looking at, for example, Paul, we see several examples in the epistles where groups of people would get together with Paul and pray for him and encourage him when he would leave on a missionary journey. We've got a couple of examples of that in his epistles, records of that actually happening. And another big one that I think about is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus knows that he is about to go this unbelievable trial that no other man has ever faced in the history of this world. And what's his first response? I'm going to get together with a bunch of my brothers and pray about it. I'm going to get together with the apostles, the people that I trust the most, my best friends, who love God and, and care about him, and we're going to pray about this. So in a sense, Jesus did exactly what Daniel is doing here years before Jesus actually came to earth, is that when he's about to have to face this big trial, when he's about to go through something that's going to be very difficult for him, and when he needs courage and he needs strength, he gets together with his friends who share his faith and go before the Almighty and ask for his favor. This is a great testament of faith for them. And I want to ask how many of our problems would be solved if we just took this same approach? How many problems in our life would we have made easier, not only easier on us, but also God through his providence making them easier on us or helping us with situations like this? Because you'll notice Daniel isn't asking to forego the trial like Jesus did in the garden, and that's also an acceptable form of prayer. But Daniel's asking for strength to be able to endure this and to be able to perform correctly and to be able to show other people God's power. And so because of this, and because he does get together with his brethren to do so, I think this is a really wonderful example of how we as individuals need to get together with our brothers and sisters and pray for strength when we know that there's something that we're going to have to go through. Why is prayer so often talked about as a last resort? I think that sometimes even we as Christians forget the power of prayer and the way that it's presented in the scripture. Because when we have somebody fall sick or somebody that's in trouble, we say, well, he's in the Lord's hands. All we can do is pray about it. And I know we don't mean any harm by that, but there's almost a sense of defeated, a defeated mentality in our voice. You know, almost like 
well, we tried everything else, so prayer is going to be what we do now. Why don't we pray before the problem comes? And I know you can't always predict that, but why don't we pray before the problem comes, go to God first, make him our first resort instead of our last resort, and then maybe we'll be a lot better off spiritually and physically in the trials of this life. See, Daniel is not only blessed by this, but he's probably encouraged by knowing that his brothers have his back as well. And our first instinct when we're going through something difficult like this should be to lean on God, and part of that is leaning on our brothers that shared the same faith. So many of our problems that we go through, so many of the heartaches that we have, would be made easier on us if we just did that first, if we just went to God and our brothers in Christ first. Stay the course, friends. I really love personal liberty. I believe in freedom of expression and freedom of association. And so it is completely up to you whether or not you want to like this video and subscribe to the Tactics Radio YouTube channel. However, I will say this. You know who else never subscribed to my channel? Hitler. So the way I see it, you have two options. You can either like this video and subscribe to Tactics Radio on YouTube, or you can be like Hitler. Totally up to you.